uh, change to the agenda. Um, Andrew has, feels that the fiscal management policy uh, should go to the finance committee for review before the board discusses it. So um, let's just kick that up to uh, pass the consent agenda, and we can just um, you know send it to the finance committee and, let's, and have discussion. And um, I'm assuming that guys are on board. Uh, and then we can just get that out of the way. Um, <coughs> All right, do uh, any public comment? First order of business. Great, um, hearing none, let's move to the consent agenda. Uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. I move we approve the consent agenda. Um, do I have a second? I'll yes. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, so policy discussion, fiscal management policy. Um, Andrew, you want to make a motion to send it to the Finance Committee? Do we yeah. need a motion? Well, let's, let's make a motion anyways. Yeah. Cause motion to send one. the Fiscal Management Policy to the Finance Committee. Second. All those, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, so Hope and Emma um, were not able to make the meeting, so um, we're not going to have the learning focus portion which gives us one item left. Uh, <laughs> two. two. Well, well, one item with two, so um, yeah. One item. Neither quickies, I suspect. Uh, <laughs> uh, so first we're going to hear about uh, language version from Mike Berry, and then we're going to talk about sex and drugs. So. Uh, <laughs> You're the lead-in to sex and drugs? Yeah, yeah always. Yeah. <laughs> I like open for Mike. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. Um, I believe in your packets you had a document that kind of outlined a, a timeline for our language immersion exploration. Um, essentially, the, the big highlights of that are forming a committee that will look at some of the big questions around language immersion in Montpelier Roxbury. Um, the process, the consideration of if we're going to make a recommendation to the superintendent for the following school year, what, what timeline we would have to keep, but with the expectation that if we need more time, we take more time, and we just do it right and we do it thoroughly. Um, I've outlined a lot on the document just in terms of the makeup of the committee, um, the process of questions, the role, the role that I play on the committee, um, and then we're basically ready to start getting going and get this conversation started. I do have a dangling conversation with the Center for Applied Linguistics. They have agreed to work with us. Uh, I just have to work out the details, so I don't have a lot of those details with me tonight. Um, the person that is assigned to our region has been traveling as part of her job, so she hasn't returned back to the office in Washington. I can answer questions, or I can, I can dig in a little bit deeper. I'm not sure where, where we want to go. Can you go through the timeline, Mike, in, sure. in thinking like just from your your brainstorm and your experience? Yeah, so right now, um, essentially what I'm gonna try and do is get in front of a lot of people, um, starting with our own staffs in each building. I have time with each staff to kind of talk about what language immersion is and what it isn't. Um, that's part of many lessons learned from past experience of implementing this program. It's important that educators in the system understand what we're trying to do or what we're looking at and what we aren't. So that's what I'm doing in terms of staff and then I'll also be offering at least probably two uh, parents and community member information sessions where I'll kind of walk through this same timeline and what our questions are and solicit some folks to join the committee and talk about the process of joining the committee. So that's, that's mainly what I'm doing between now and the second week of June is really getting going on that stuff. We've already created a web page and uh, for information, another lesson learned is to be totally transparent with this process and to be able to share a lot of information, a lot of resources. Um, we'll probably video the uh, parent community sessions so people that can't go can attend those. I'll offer to meet with anyone that can't attend. All of those things really going above and beyond to be able to connect with people and share what's going on. Um, in July, the committee would meet, uh, talk about uh, the process. I'd like to invite a 
uh, representative from Chittin East that does have a language immersion program right now to come and speak to the committee about the process and implementation, be able to answer some questions. We'll form our own questions about Montpelier Roxbury and what this means. Um, we'll talk about probably some research assignments in between for each representative on the committee. So here are our big questions. Let's go out and let's talk to some people um, that have programs. And then we'll review some of the information from Cal about their guiding principles. They have a really thorough process available online for committees to walk through, considering logistics, uh, sustainability, curriculum, culture in the schools, cultural identity standards, all of these different things. And then in September, we hope to visit a program as a committee um, and also meet with the Center for Applied Linguistics in November, finalize our recommendations so that if there are any considerations in terms of budget, we would have that information in a timely manner. But like I said before, if we get to that point, we still have a ton of questions, that's fine. Let's adjust the timeline and do it right and have a good conversation as a community. Great. Bridget? Thanks, it, this is so exciting, and thank you for coming tonight, it's great. I have, actually I have several questions. Okay. Um, uh, the, f the first is, actually this is not a question, but it's just an observation. Um, there was a committee that this district had that I think worked very hard on foreign language issues that predates all of us that are here. Actually, I think only Michelle was actually here when that committee yeah. existed. But I just wanted to flag that because it predates, okay. um, there's still a lot of parents in the community that worked very hard on that and there, um, there was a lot of frustration that that committee did that work and nothing came of it. Um, I'm not, I assume the report is available in so the I will district. Share it. I actually but met with two parents that were on That's there. great. I was just gonna say, I yeah. think that would be great to try to continue yeah. that loop because I think those folks did did a lot of work and they it just that. didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that awesome, all right. So I just wanted to, to try to find a way to bring those folks into the process to some extent. Yeah. Um, and then I was uh, curious about the parents whose kids might be in the program and how you see that, like, because this process, which is great, will involve a lot of um, contact with parents, but it was occurring to me that the parents whose kids might enroll in this are sure. not yet in the district, right? Yeah. They don't have kids in the district yet because they're younger. <coughs> and I, I'm interested in your um, reaction to that. And also, um, is the, is the, is it specifically um, what's under consideration starting in kindergarten, or is the possibility of it being in preschool on the table, yeah, but not so yet decided? That's a great question. Uh, I'll talk about a couple of things. <clears throat> One is that, yeah, you're right, that the target audience sometimes for this in terms of parents is two or three years out in, in terms of when we would start. So I just, I tend to be upfront with that. We do have census information, so I'm able to share this and canvas a broader group of people, talk to preschool families specifically, send home information, do those things, and try and involve them in that way. Um, the other thing is that I would say we looked at preschool and those components and when to start, and, and the research is pretty solidly clear about the developmental guidelines and that kindergarten is the, the best target year to do that for a lot of reasons, including that it's a full day program, those kinds of things. It doesn't exclude uh, language work at preschool level, mm -hmm. but they were very specific. Last time that I spoke to them about this, they were very specific about what to do and what not to do with that. It's mainly exploratory, it's play-based, it's a lot of opportunity to hear different language, but it's not as structured or immersive as we might do at a kindergarten, particularly in a language immersion program. So the, that's, that's what I know about that conversation, but I think it's worth a conversation with preschool once we get established, if we get established, what, what that would look like. But you're right, Thanks. it's, you're talking to parents whose kindergarten students are going to be coming in potentially one or two years from now. Um, and that's, that's a group that I have to go out and seek to a degree in this conversation. Great, thanks. So I have a question because it looks like you're doing this, which is great, mm -hmm. but somehow I thought we were hiring a <coughs> consultant who would evaluate our situation. Yeah, that's the CAL, that's the Center for Applied Linguistics. So those folks would come a total of four to five times for full days and also provide us research support in between. Oh, okay. So they'll, they'll be extremely helpful, um, but they're from Washington, D.C., so they will potentially only be here a couple times. We are, however, talking with Chip and East about partnering on having these folks come in and doing potentially a regional event because there are a lot of schools that are looking at this. 
Um, so we may be able to benefit by hosting that or having them a little more accessible. So we're working on that as well. I'm loving the fact that you're going to go visit a program that exists, and it would be lovely if staff, some staff, could go with you. Yeah, the committee would have representative members from the staff, general education, also English language learners, um, a foreign language instructor, um, things like that. Depending on where we go to visit, it makes a difference. Right. Um, you know, Chittenden East is relatively close, and we can access that pretty easily. I think it would be valuable to also go to uh, Menden Upton in Massachusetts, which is a long established program. Oh, nice. Um, but maybe with fewer people from the committee. It's just always nice to see it in practice. Agreed. Especially if you're not sure about it. Yep. Andrew. Yes, sir. So I think this is a very thoughtful process, awesome level of engagement. Um, general question that I have is what is the time commitment? Um, going to be for committee members? How, like how many times a month do sure. you anticipate they'll meet? I anticipate it would be about one time a month between now and November of next year. That's just based on my past experience, but that doesn't preclude kind of research assignments outside of the meetings or potentially subgroups of the committee working on certain things. Um, or maybe it will just go super smooth and we won't need that many. Uh, um, but I would anticipate no fewer than one. Thanks. We do have a, a questionnaire for folks that are interested in being on the committee. It has about five questions, just generally asking about their interests, um, any questions that they might have ahead of time, things like that. Other questions? Is part of the evaluation process going to be also looking at um, the latest use in space? Like yes. Where to physically house this? Yes. How to yeah, a big uh, part of this process is really sustainability. It's a, it's a five year and beyond commitment in terms of space, staffing, um, curriculum development, all of those things. So there's a lot of logistics that we'll be looking at. Part of my role with the with the committee will be to, to research those things and provide feedback to the committee on what I found um, in terms of facilities, staffing, uh, embassy programs, partnerships, all of those different things that we can find and talk about. I'm thinking space. They're all in a space now. It's a reorganization of the people <coughs> that are in it. That doesn't s solve staff issues, but yeah. it's the same kids. Mm -hmm. Bridget. Um, I have one um, suggestion that uh, just based on the board's ongoing conversations and commitment to the diversity, equity, and inclusion principles and policy that the board adopted, and I know from conversations that we've already had with the superintendent that those principles are already part of the thinking around this program, um, but I wondered if maybe we should say that in the document. Yeah. So I just throw, that, I mean, it's not the board, it's not the board's document, but I just throw that out there for consideration of whether that should be part of the um, tasks of the committee to ensure that, it's an ensure that any program opportunity. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That's a good idea. So I'm curious, Michael, would it be possible, the calendar is very specific in terms of the instruction and the program itself, mm -hmm. and obviously you're talking about soliciting parents for the committee right now. It would be nice for parents to know maybe some mile markers for when feedback would be available from them or to get maybe some rough drafts um, just for more parent to community input to expect that, hey, by July we should be able to see a rough, rough draft or um, just to have. I, th I think we can do that. I think we can be really transparent. I'm hesitant to um, guess on where the committee will be. Sure. <coughs> but just making sure that we do have opportunities to get. Yes. Yep. <coughs> Great. Yeah. No, this is super exciting. I'm, I'm really <coughs> glad we're doing this. And as Bridget mentioned, um, you know, this is something the district has been looking at for a while. It's been a tough nut to crack, but I think it's given the realities of the 21st century world. Um, yeah, I think we need to, to broaden language opportunities. And this is a really creative and great way to do it. So. Um, I'm excited to see how this process unfolds. 
if a community member was interested in being on this committee, they would. So we'll be making a post. Um, I was waiting until this meeting uh, to see if there's any additional feedback. We'll be making <coughs> posts and communications. We'll be going out through the schools to community members, but also very publicly soliciting information. Like I said, in the next month, the general goal is for me to get in front of a lot of people in a, a lot of different places and just talk about this. So we'll, we'll get it out there. And then there'll be a link where people can fill out the questionnaire, and then it'll go right, right to me. Talking about that audience of the, the kids, the parents, or the families that would have kids in a program such as this, does anybody have any suggestions for Mike or otherwise suggestions for how to get information out to those families? Child care centers. I mean, yeah. I'm sorry. That was well, I mean, we've got kids right now in the pre-K program, which we, you know, didn't have in previous years, so we can, you know, I think we've got microphones out to certain people that we didn't have before, but the library, I might, might the, be library. Good. the library, and also you know some <coughs> of the private providers like you know Turtle Island and, and Children's House might have some parents that would be very interested. In. We have some students in East Montpelier Pre-K too. Mm -hmm. I, I have I have met with parents that were on that original committee. Um, and they've offered to assist in getting the word out as well. So okay. I, I plan on calling that in. Great. Great. Letting them help us. And how many board members going are you thinking? One? No, more than seven. I think we settled on. One or two. And I think it was one. Um, so part of just to be up front, um, it's a committee that needs to be somewhat nimble. Yep. That's that's the rationale for the the, uh, the numbers. Um, I believe we said one. Yeah, that's that's what I'm remembering too. Well, you're lucky because we're a very nimble board. Yes, yeah, agreed. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to give some thought to who might want to do that and who has who has who has the time and can be nimble. <laughs> Are you looking for volunteers right now? looking right now? Uh, I'm not looking right now. Oh, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> but I just wanted to plant the seed. Bridget was looking at <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I mean, if people want to say they're interested now, then, you know, but I don't think we need to make any decisions. But um, <clears throat> just, you know, something to think about because it sounds like this might be coming together relatively soon. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Nice. Thank I'm just going to stay right here. <laughs> oh, are you on next as well? <laughs> so he's I, in a supporting role. <laughs> yes, I think before we hear from the mics, um, we're going to hear from uh, a couple of community members who have um, talked to us and been very involved in this issue. Barbara Heidal and Andy Crane. And Andy uh, works with Planned Parenthood. Um, so she has expertise, although I think she's going to give us a qualifier that she is not Just speaking on behalf. <laughs> Ditch in the name. Ditch in the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Barbarina Heyerdahl. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm a mom. I have four kids, two of whom have attended Montpelier High School. I don't have any fancy letters after my name, but Andy and I became good friends because she's a midwife. I had wanted to be a midwife. She has babies. I have babies. Um, and we share a passion for all things sexuality and talking to kids about sexuality. And I run a small philanthropic fund, which um, has me working in politics. And I'm deeply fascinated by how power works in our country and our culture. And there was really two events over the past few years that you and I talked about a lot, which got us thinking about how we talk about sexuality with our children. And the first was the breaking of the Harvey Weinstein story. I went to hear Jody Cantor speak at UVM. She was the New York Times reporter who broke the story. And I went with a friend who works as a lobbyist in the State House who has put up with quite a lot of sexual harassment under our Golden Dome. And as interesting as Jody Cantor's presentation was, in some ways what was more powerful was hearing the questions. 
that were addressed to her, predominantly by Nubian students. And the final question was basically, what do we do with these men after the accusations and the immediate consequences that they may face? And my friend and I in our drive home, both of us uh, parents of sons, realized how important and big and tangled a question as that is. What really interested us was how do we not raise another generation of Harvey Weinstein's? Second thing for me, the Kavanaugh hearings. And I'm old enough to remember the Clarence Thomas hearings. And at the time, in addition to the all-white, all-male Senate Judiciary um, Committee members who were running those hearings, it seemed like based on polling, there was a consensus among the broader public that Clarence Thomas could not have done these things. And therefore, it was completely justifiable to humiliate and vilify Anita Hill. As bad as that was, I felt like in watching the Clarence, I mean, the Brett Kavanaugh hearings, there had almost been a shift to maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It doesn't really matter, at least when it comes to a man taking power. And I just thought about as I watched this and had lots of conversations with my 16-year-old son, what kind of a message does that send to our young men and our young girls that what happens to a girl's body is really not of consequence in terms of our young men's later lives and the power that they may get. Um, but moving, oh, another thing that fed into your and my conversations about this was a study that I read, a poll of high school students and college students, female, was that 70% of them reported that in their perspective, a positive sexual experience was one in which they were not frightened nor physically hurt. And I just felt that was such a heartbreaking low bar. And we just started having more and more conversations about how are we talking about sexuality with our students. So I have four kids. I interviewed each and every one of them. <laughs> Tell me about each and every sex ed class you had. And it was fascinating. Um, I think words matter, and this is just one aspect of what we talked about. But, and they, they did not go to Montpelier Middle School, which is where all my kids have their sex ed, who um, used to live in Jimmy County. But they reported that it was completely conception focused and biology focused. And I talk about things graphically, so I'm going to use some terms, which I'm guessing will be okay. You know, penises are talked about, testicles are talked about, ejaculation is talked about. But all of my kids reported that when it came to the woman's body, there was talk of the womb, and there was the talk of the birth canal, and clitoris was never mentioned once. And it's interesting, because when you look at some other Western democracies, France in particular, in addition to the teaching of the biology and the very important essential lessons about consent and safety and um, sexually transmitted disease, they also focus it in connection and pleasure and embed the whole idea of sexuality as part of our richer, full human lives. And I found myself thinking, I live next door to Necky. I heard a sex therapist talk on the radio back in the 1990s and she had written a book with a perplexing title of Sex is Not a Natural Act. And her point was that, of course, there is a biological imperative to sex, and it does produce babies. But in many ways, human beings' relationship to sexuality is quite analogous to our relationship to food and cuisine. So yes, we all eat so we don't starve. But for those of us who are lucky to be food secure, there's a lot more to it. And I imagined what it would be like for Nike students to go through an entire semester in which they learned about the physiology of digestion, how not to pass on foodborne illnesses, how not to force people who didn't want to eat to eat, and how to not cut themselves with knives. All really important valid topics. But I could imagine the students feeling a little ripped off. <laughs> raising a hand and saying, are we ever going to learn how to make chocolate mousse? So 
part of what Andy and I have been talking about is what is the broader way in which we can talk about <coughs> sexuality with our kids, answer their questions, and what each of my kids reported that they most appreciated in their middle school sexuality class was the anonymous question box, a place where they could write down any question with no fear of embarrassment about any aspect of sexuality, both the nitty gritty of the biology and the anatomy, but also broader cultural questions. And an adult whom they really trusted and respected would take the questions out and answer them and facilitate peer-to-peer -peer conversations. So, um, I'm a mom in this community as of three years ago, I moved here. Um, I'm also a healthcare provider, as Jim had mentioned. I am not representing Planned Parenthood tonight, I'm just me, just as a heads up. Um, but I have had the luxury of being a certified nurse midwife who specializes in reproductive health care, who has been able to start working with many youth in our community through their actual health care needs. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've found incredibly interesting is the spectrum of preparedness that the students from this school district have come to me with, because I do a lot of education on this. Some are extremely prepared, but it's to a scary point. And one story that made me sort of drop everything and say, all right, I always wanted to get into this kind of topics, I'm doing it now was a young woman, I think she was 17, she was preparing to graduate and go to college last year. And she came in with her mother, and she wanted an intrauterine device. And for those of you that don't know, they get implanted in your uterus, they're a very effective method of contraception, very low failure rate, some of our best. Kind of crampy, not super comfortable, definitely, you know, one of the most uncomfortable methods of contraception to put in, but one that's often elected. But this young woman had a fear of medical procedures. She had a lot of trauma with um, you know, medical procedures earlier in her life, yet she was picking this one, the most effective one. And I always ask, so what makes you choose this method of contraception? And she very calmly, with her mother by her side, said to me, well, I'm going off to college, and I know that there is a better chance that I will be raped than I won't, and I need to prepare so that I don't have a child from that experience one of the few times that I just didn't know how to respond because that's very intense to hear a young woman just culturally accept this is my lived reality and this is what I know is higher likelihood going to happen and based on you know the assumption of lack of reported um, cases we know that we're likely at around like a 60 to 66 percent rate of sexual assault in colleges in our country um, so if you're right you know she was correct it was a higher likelihood that she will than not so we have that type of student that yes is prepared, but oh my goodness, can we do something about that, you know, in terms of our community? All the way transcending to the student that I really feel like isn't prepared in a wholly different way, but operating still within that culture, which is, you know, a young woman who comes in for a pregnancy test because her period's late, <coughs> completely <coughs> confounded because he said if he was drunk, then the sperm would be drunk and couldn't swim straight, so therefore she wouldn't get pregnant. So that has a lot of layers of complexity that is also really disheartening, too. And so, you know, that combined with the high propensity of sexual assault follow-up I do see during the course of my week, I thought, we, what can we do? How can we make this better? What's happening in this community? I'm new, I don't know, so I'm gonna go start talking to people. So many conversations with Barbarina, and I also spent this past school year kind of just connecting with our school, our elementary, our middle school, um, my, minimally with the high school. I have young kids, three and a half and six, so I haven't quite gotten up that, to that realm yet. But the, the elementary school, when I was speaking with the guidance counselor, she's like, yeah, there's interest, and parents are wanting this information. And I managed to be fortunate enough to connect with Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, one of their trainers there, and you know, they, we are so well supported in this community in terms of what already exists. So when parents say, yes, please, can I get in on a workshop that's about nurturing healthy sexual development? Boom, we've got like a community partner that has that going on and it's connecting the dots. So that's been some of the, the exploration we've done at the elementary school this year. And then at the middle school, I've been having some really interesting conversations. I mean, 
from what I hear in the community as a parent, yes, the desire is there to improve health education and sexual education. But when I start talking to the educators, there's a lot of fear. The culture that educators find themselves in right now, especially with the Me Too movement, is I'm worried about misstepping. This is a sensitive topic. These are things that are out there in the news, and it, it's a bit scary, because if I misstep, I could lose my job. Look at all these different examples we've seen in popular culture recently. And so when I was talking with educators in our school district, they were saying, you know, I know this is a need. This is something I'm really invested in. I really feel like I need support from all areas. I want support from the community. I want support from the parents. I want support from the top down. I want administrative support. I just like everybody to be on board so that I feel like, yeah, I can tackle these tough topics with these kids who really are craving this information in a community that, based on my conversations around town, many people seem supportive. Obviously, not everybody's going to be on board. But I think one thing we could agree on is that both examples I gave you of those young women that came to me is not a culture we really want our youth growing up in. And so one of our community partners, the Vermont Network, um, did a really interesting study at the end of 2018. And they said to Vermont youth, what do you want? What would you like out of health education, right? You know, that's a novel idea. And the number one thing that our Vermont youth, this is not even the country, this is like us, said is I want an askable adult to ask whatever I want of. Someone that's trustworthy, someone that I'm not gonna get judged. And knowing teens, likely in a way where they're not gonna have to stand up and raise their hand because it's not the age or the hormonal milieu of what happens, right? So in terms of those opportunities or setting those cultures of that anonymous question box where someone who is that askable adult can answer those. And you know, creating a culture where kids, yes, can help shape the education they want, but yes, this is a grander community context and conversation. Um, and so I feel like that's sort of why we're here today is we would love the school board to be supportive of something on maybe a policy level or whatever it is that could move forward. I will also add my um, my other son who attended the high school, he's graduated now, he was very active in the conversation, student-led program that looks at rape culture nationally in Montpelier and at Montpelier High. And he found it such a powerful, transformative opportunity. He even wrote his college essay without having been part of the conversation. But it feels like in addition to having the askable adult who's trustworthy, where you can get really solid information back, rather than having sexuality education just be one week in middle school, are there ways to, throughout our kids' education, create episodic forms where there's good, solid information presented, and it feels sufficiently safe that there can be peer-to-peer -peer conversations as well. And one piece I forgot, which is relevant to one of my kids, is having sexuality education so focused on biology and conception is not entirely relevant for our LGBTQ students. And are there ways where we can expand the curriculum that acknowledges that sexuality, although absolutely Part and parcel of conception is also much more so that our LGBTQ students don't just zone out when it's focused primarily on conception. And I will also say, I knew Jill Krowinski, who serves in the legislature, and she was part of the revising of the state sexuality curriculum, I think 14 years ago. And in my conversations with her, she said she is entirely open to having conversations with educators and administrators and school boards about how the statewide education could be revised again, because I'm sure that's a big variable. Anything else? Great, thank you. Any questions? Right. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank, yeah. you. Yes. thank you for listening. Thank you for coming. Very helpful. Um, Mike and Mike? So 
I guess if you could give, um, so just kind of to set the table a little, uh, yeah, this is a this is a topic that's come up, I think, both in terms of of how health education impacts how we teach sex and sexuality, uh, but also increasingly how we teach, um, you know, navigating through uh, drug use and you know the various mixed signals there. We obviously have, uh, you know, with the legalization of marijuana, uh, and I think a bit of, you know. My understanding is that marijuana use in, the, in the high school, in particular, uh, certainly is present and somewhat of an issue. Uh, you know, statewide we have an opioid crisis. Uh, we also have you know vaping and Juul and other forms of taking tobacco and other substances that um, you know certainly I don't fully understand that are relatively new. Uh, yeah, I mean the. You know, the board does not get involved in setting curriculum or you know what's happening in the classroom. But um, I think in terms of we hear this from the community a lot. Uh, I think there are a set of, of values that a good portion of the community share in terms about approaching this in a really progressive way that prepares our kids for a complex world and allows them to be you know full adults who uh, make wise choices and, and are able to make fulfilling choices. Um, so I, I would love to hear kind of what, you know, what the approach is at the high school, what the approach is from a curriculum level and what the board can do uh, to encourage that, you know, we, one, have, have given you the tools and the direction to do what you need to do as educators. Uh, and then second, I think, you know, a point that, that was, was made by Barbarina and, and Andy, um, what can we do to broaden the conversation? Because I think just hitching these complex issues on what we teach in certain classes uh, isn't going to cut it. That this has to be, you know, we have to find ways to connect with community resources uh, to have broader conversations to bring, uh, you know, the full adult community in, um, and 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 really look at this as a a community issue. And and you know, the board is the liaison between educators and the community. I think we have a natural role there. Anyone yeah. else want to add before they delve in in terms of things you'd like to either hear or um, or things I missed? I definitely want to hear about the middle school as well yeah. as the high school. Mm -hmm. Jackson, yeah. Mike, say what do. Yeah. Sure. So I can speak to this. Um, so just tell me if it feels like it's a too far afield or not exactly what you're looking for. Um, you know, uh, Andy and Barbara and Libby and Jim and I met earlier this year, and you know that's had my wheels turning and has led to some specific action too since that time. And they make very important and well uh, reasoned points. Um, and health is both a very broad uh, topic and uh, also important and, and very narrow sometimes when we're talking about real specific kinds of things. So the, the board passed a nutrition policy uh, a few years ago, it's F28, that uh, addresses uh, nutrition in the district in a real direct way. And that you know, doesn't touch anything around health curriculum uh, in, in the way that Andy and Barbarina are talking about, nor does it sort of get at you know, this larger cultural issue of misogyny and, and how what we can do to unpack that and to improve uh, that experience for our young people and our, and our broader community. So uh, wh where are we? Uh, I think one is there's there's a need for vertical alignment um, in the specific health, health curriculum uh, in the district. Uh, if you remember, maybe some of you do, uh, that we added FTE to middle school health just recently. Yeah. And so there's an element of that taking hold and for those educators to begin collaborating. And 
Libby's already asked Mike to lead a group of, of the health educators to get together and to look at you know what is it that we're actually teaching with direct health curriculum um, pre-k 12 and so that needs to happen and is underway and then the second thing is there's this real need for a comprehensive approach that there's these real targeted times in, in, a, in a health class but what else are we doing and can we pull some of those things together and have more of a strategic approach rather than uh, the conversation is great at the high school. How much is it uh, dialoguing or working with uh, existing curriculum and, and courses, including health curriculum? But you know, our English department did a really thoughtful and, and uh, progressive gender unit uh, in the English class this year, tenth grade, um, that partnered with Outright Vermont. And so, you know, how much it, would there be a need for a, sort of like an audit to see what, what we're doing and how those things are sort of coordinating uh, together? Um, we have a wellness initiative. Uh, you know, are our guide, do our guidance counselors need to, to be a part of that vertical alignment? Do they need to be um, grouped together separately? Those are all things to consider. Nursing, you know, how how much is there overlap with with what our nurses are doing and how they're interacting with our students, um, and then you know what kind of opportunities are there in the community to partner more and to involve parents, and all all to you know, along all of those lines, there's probably an opportunity to communicate. Like for example, um, you know, this year, not only spurred by. Um, conversation raised in the community but also just from our own students telling us that in the health cur curriculum needs uh, a fresh look um, particularly around our LGBTQ plus population uh, we've really worked to make that more inclusive we've had health educators attend workshops uh, that have been held by the Vermont Higher Ed Collaborative that are is really it's outright Vermont that's been doing those and they've they were in such high demand in the state that they ended up running several sessions um, so we're not alone in the need to, to update uh, those experiences and make them more inclusive um, and then you know there's there's lots of different uh, quality um, existing curriculum whether that be the things that uh, our, many of our students participate in the Unitarian Church with um, the OWL program or Planned Parenthood or Advocates for Youth um, or working directly uh, with Outright. All of those are things that have been um, filtered into our students' lives and into the, our school life. So should we strengthen those partnerships um, would be one of the questions probably on the table as an opportunity. And then, um, you know, when you think about the quantity uh, of direct instruction, it's really pretty minimal um, for middle schoolers to, to have it as an elective, and that has increased just recently. But high school expectations around the state, including Montpelier, or just a half credit, um, just a semester's worth of health. And so for us, that's been four units. It's, uh, we've done mental health, addiction, sexuality, and disease. And in my conversations with our health instructors, you know, it, it feels like there's so many things that are, are left off. Um, the table, but you really don't have a lot of a lot of time with with that expectation. So, one of the things we just were kicking around in this conversation, as it's been raised in the community, is you know maybe we just have to just go to you know men mental health and, and you know even incorporate addiction into that, and also uh, just doubling our time that we're spending on, on relationships and sexuality. Um, because it feels like maybe that there's a need for that. Uh, so that's been part of it. And I think that that speaks to the need for a more comprehensive uh, approach. Uh, and the, the other thing that is missing from 
the district, which has existed in the past and it exists in other districts, is an SAP. And depending on who you ask, that's either a substance abuse professional or a student assistance program. Um, I think sometimes it's not very, uh, well, you said this, it's the, you know, who wants to be sent to see the substance abuse prevention person? <laughs> yeah. um, so sometimes uh, it's, it's different. We, we just don't have, we don't have one. And I think I might have been part of that in my first month here. We did an open part-time SAP position. And we also had one and a half social workers in the district. And I advocated pretty strongly that we have a social worker at each building. And part of the bargaining on that was to let go of this unfilled SAP part-time position. And it's just never come back. And so I think based on uh, what are likely to be high numbers from our youth risk behavior survey uh, around drug usage, that's just anecdotal, and also statistical evidence of the number of students that we intervened with, particularly last year at the high school, um, that there would be reasonable need uh, for an SAP in the district um, to, you know, to be proposed for next year's budget. Um, we also have the Youth Service Bureau as our primary partner um, for post-intervention uh, a lot of times, uh, particularly around substance issues. And uh, our mental health support primary community partner is Washington County Mental Health, of which the Youth Service Bureau is a part of. And oftentimes, their capacity is lower than our need. Um, we experience that on a regular basis. Um, I won't get into the, any specifics of just today, but um, oftentimes there, there are students uh, who, whose needs are, are not able to be met because of, uh, of capacity. Um, with our community partner too. So that, that's kind of a 30,000 foot issue, but it's something to keep in mind if we're trying to build uh, awareness and strength in our community around these issues, that that is one area that um, can sometimes be an issue too. So that's a lot of information. What yeah. landed? What did I miss? I wrote that for him. <laughs> <laughs> On that last part, Mike, can you yeah. just provide general, I know you don't want to get into specifics, but can you just provide general examples of the types of needs yeah. that you feel are out there? One of the what things that I can say with confidence about a state need is uh, temporary residential um, mental health support for youth in the state. There's always a shortage of beds. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, if there's a real shortage of, of beds, we'll have a student that ends up at the screeners, and what that means for self-harm. And the screeners don't have anywhere for them to go. Um, so maybe they're okay to go home. And if it's um, not beds, it's people. They don't have any people to yeah. provide support Another to the family too. Another would be that uh, student um, has an identified need or a reference from us or from someone else for a counselor, and they might be on a six to eight week wait list. Or more. Um, part of Washington County Mental Health's challenge is that they're, they're trying to develop different business models, and it's truly a business model. So they're working within this pod function now. And if you're not a school district who has purchased a pod, which we are not because we don't have that great of need, I mean, that's significant support and they don't have enough to go around for every district. So if you haven't purchased this pod, you can't access their services. What, what is it, it's a pod? It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a group of professionals that work within your school, school buildings um, and work directly with kids, so they have you know, cases and, and, and a list, you know, a client list, basically. Um, and so places like Washington Central, Northfield and Williamstown have much higher need for that type of support and have purchased pods and it's working out very well with them in a very collaborative nature. But when we have the one kid who pops up 
that desperately needs mental health support. Because it is, with us, we can name the kids, right? We can see them, it's not a group, it's, we can name them. Um, Washington County says, sorry, you don't have a pod. Um, or, and we don't have any extra people outside of our pods. So it's, it's a business model that also gets in the way of support. However, they don't have anything else to offer kids and families who need the support. And so they get on these long waiting lists. We had a kid on a waiting list for uh, six months, and we finally just went with a different provider, we, and a, a different provider that's not as strong. And I've, kid. I've found in the past that because they don't have enough people at the state level, they can only pay attention to the most drastic in, in preference to coming up to doing something in preparation so you don't get to that point. They just don't have the people. Now with the pod them. model, they don't, that's not even their priority. Their pod is to try to get as many kids supported as possible oh, good. within school, school systems. systems. So they're, they're working, like I'll just keep going with like the Northfield Williamson district, right? They're working with more kids in that district and they're influencing more kids positively. But it means our kids don't, don't get the service. Um, and we could have the most challenging kid in the state and it wouldn't matter right now for Washington County Mental Health. It just wouldn't matter. It's just not within their realm of ability to support us. Is there any opportunity to kind of leverage some, some sharing, some economies of scale with some of our neighboring districts? Not with this type of model. Yeah. It's not allowable. So I, Mary Lundine and I went to a meeting with them with a region, right? Mm -hmm. So soups and special ed directors were there from across the region and, and they're explaining their models to us. And so I raised a, my hand. I said, I'm a newbie to this county. You know, we have different models in Chittenden and Franklin County. So what I'm understanding is if I don't purchase a pod for my school district, I no longer can access you at all. And they said, yeah, that's it. That's, that's pretty much it. And so then I said, all right, we're done here then. <laughs> I'm going I'm to go find another solution for our district, which is why we're investing in a social emotional learning coordinator. Do you know if U32 has a pod? Washington Central didn't. Oh, you, I know you were talking about Northfield Williamson. I'm not sure. I don't believe they do, but I'm not positive. I don't know. What's they the might, point? actually. Actually, they might at U32. What's the cost? You, you know, I, no. I'm sorry to know. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I can't help but notice um, that uh, health is such a, a broad term, and that's why you know our conversation or or what we do as action steps could just go in so many different directions, like right right now. Um, and you know, one of the things that I I heard in um, Andy and Barbarina's uh, points is you know, an element of, of toxic masculinity or um, misogyny as, as being something to, to try to take on as, as part of thinking about health differently. And I think that that um, in of itself is a really big challenge, but, but one that we're engaged in, I, I think and that could could be strengthened. I felt like I left out, like a, a hot spot might be um, like coaching um, and, and, and any kind of uh, sports, you know, to, to improve in the orientation with those folks. Um, and then uh, after school programming to thinking about uh, mental health and, and um, positive role models and, and positive programming I think that maybe I'm jumping the, and anticipating what maybe the next uh, question would be, but strengthening those things would be one action step, in, in my opinion. The SAP probably is clearly another potential action step. Um, the, the pulling together uh, within the district to see where we're at and how much we're aligned and, and how we can move in a more coordinated way uh, is another step. Um, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, there's so many things that could fall under this as a, as a category. Um, and isn't it kind of like all about, about health? So I'm just sort of cautioning us to, to say, you know, what, what is it that we're trying to zero in on? Because 
right away we started to go down the a mental health path and community partners with with uh, Washington County mental health, which is a rich topic. Um, and so, you know, how how broad might we get if we're not careful with that? And Mike, just to point out that, so he and I, we've sat in what, four meetings around how, four or five just this year, and mind you, I've had no other curricular conversations with parents <laughs> this year. And, um, and on the total right. ends of the, the spectrum. Right, oh, so. Like we are being way too explicit. We're giving way too much information. I want, I want yeah. notified so I can pull my kid out of this. Because mm -hmm. this is my responsibility to teach my kid to, mm -hmm. whoa, no, you're not, this needs to be way more in depth. Oh. There's a question there. Go ahead. She had one down oh, there first. Lisa, uh, well, it seems to me like there should be a policy. There's a nutrition policy. I think that, um, you know, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy sort of touches on some of this, but, and maybe it addresses it enough to direct the Excuse district, me. but. Uh, perhaps there needs to be something stronger from the board. Yeah. And, and I was thinking, since I spent so much time in middle school, and, and about what you talked about was, um, I, I'm not sure how, how comfortable the faculty is that, that goes without, yeah. beyond the health faculty. And, and you want somebody that kids can talk to, that want to talk to it. And I don't want to add yet another thing to the, teacher's plate, but then again, um, maybe we need some more training or, um, and it's a big assumption, but on middle school being a little different, but that's where all the questions begin. Yeah, I think along the lines of the anonymous question box, I mean, that's just that. a totally reasonable idea and one that a lot of schools apply. I've been a part of that. I've been in that room with seventh graders. Um, and it was good. I think it well, not in this district, I, I didn't. but um, I think that part of pulling that team together um, can be thinking about that, that suggestion and thinking about how to in, improve um, the direct instruction around curriculum and, and continue to update it to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so that, that seems like it's in the works to me. Okay. I'd really like to hear more if Mike is able to do it. I, I don't want to put you on the spot about exactly what the curriculum is at the middle school now. So I can talk a little bit about what we've been doing. Um, and I offer it not as an excuse, but part of the challenge. Uh, as Mike mentioned, when we say health, as we started to pull together this group for me to meet with, it went from health educators to health educators and guidance counselors, health educators, PE teachers, guidance counselors, and nurses to general ed classrooms. So that was part of, and part of the initial conversation is what is what is it we're talking about when we say health curriculum? So we've started to have those conversations at the middle school, and this is my understanding, I don't want to misrepresent it, but my understanding is that for a period of time there wasn't health specific education in at least two grade levels. That was my understanding too. Um, and now they've added it to one of those two, and I believe that the conversation is to add in that final, I think it's seventh grade that doesn't have it right now. Um, so there, that's the conversation that's happening there. I have time scheduled with the health educators there to talk to them. Essentially when Libby, Mike, and myself started talking about this, what I wanted to do is meet with the health educators, which is depending on the school, a variety of different people in different positions, and hear from them what's going on in health education. What is the health curriculum? What is it that, that you see as the challenge? Where do we need to start this conversation? And the immediate um, interesting thing was that it wasn't just the health educator. It was, oh, you should meet with the nurse as well, and our guidance counselor, and we have a parent volunteer in the general ed classroom at the elementary school. So it is a very broad group of people to talk to about what's going on with health education. But it has begun. Um, the middle school has been looking at two specific curricula in terms of what they are doing for health education. And I have a scheduled meeting with them next week to hear their feedback on those two pieces that they've been looking at. Is that around sex education particularly or just health in general? 
I think it's it's around health in general. <coughs> however, there's a strong emphasis on sexuality. And in terms of the amount of time, that's like a, a tr uh, what a six week segment in a I particular know, year, or I but I mean, it's not very much. I, think, I, is, I don't. Is my understanding. The feedback I heard from them was that it's not as much as they want to be doing. I think it's I think it's I think it's moved around a lot. I think that mm -hmm. that's part of why it has come up in the community mm -hmm. is the the amount of health direct health education that students have had is very and I think that that's one of the opportunities that we see collectively both as a community and as administration to be more consistent and invest more in it, I think. And a challenge. What are you yes. going to take away from? That, that's, a, that's a challenge. Yes. Yes. So if you're taking the time for that, what are you going to take Ryan, did you have your hand? I think yes. it has ebbed and flowed with the priorities of different administrators and different boards, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And probably students, too. Um, slightly related, but maybe more in the opposite direction. So, when we had the discussion last year about adding the extra FTE in the middle school for health education, you know, the argument is made, and rightfully so, the kids come to school today with a lot less help from home, we'll say on a lot of general health, wellness, mental health, the whole spectrum. Can you tell me, do any districts do anything proactively to engage or educate parents to get families or parents more involved in assisting on some of these topics to, I don't want to say lessen the burden from the district, but maybe a lot of the conversation from Andy and Barbarina tonight have really looked at like a more global change in culture and changing atmospheres and uh, that's not necessarily done just by direct um, instruction. And it seems like maybe more family involvement could be a piece in accomplishing that. And, and again, I'm guessing that districts probably don't, but I was curious if there were examples of districts maybe trying to do more to engage or bring parents into the mix. Yeah, I, I appreciate Andy's point about um, that we actually live in a community where there are community partners that are possible. Um, and I actually think that there, there's a lot that happens all the time. Um, you know, I mentioned the Unitarian Church um, that does this OWL program with a lot of our students. And those students often come into our health class, you know, like, I, I know all this. You know, I, I've seen all this. Um, so, uh, I think that there is a fair bit that does happen, which is why a lot of our, our students um, are pretty comfortable and in, in a good spot. The question is, is who isn't that hidden? Sure. Um, and how can we engage those families um, that maybe not are not already engaged with all that is, is available? Um, and I think that's a bigger challenge because oftentimes those families are have a lot of stressors and you know, coming coming into the library for a few hours on a Wednesday night might not be their top priority. So, there are some some programs in Chittenden County. Um, I know that, and as Libby mentions, it's kind of a different system up there with the mental health providers. Um, I know that Camel's Hump Middle School, for example, has a program um, for uh, I forget the name of the program, but it's for families, and they do everything from nutrition education to sexuality conversations, very supportive process, and it's a small cohort of families that are, are identified of need, but there's a tremendous amount of partnership that happens uh, through that. And then also, uh, they do have an SAP model where that person is helping to coordinate a lot of parent education. Um, it's connected to some grants and connected to the CDC health uh, curriculum and standards, so it's really, pretty structured and guided in a good way. But it, again, as Mike said, it, it really partners with community partners, and there's fewer of those up there. So there's an even greater opportunity here. Are we being intentional about um, using opportunities? I just kind of drawing from you know, past high school experience, where you know, things like prom, things like the culture on some sports teams, et cetera, uh, things, frankly, that kids oftentimes are very cued into. Um, 
the at least subtext of some of those things tends to be at odds with other messages we're sending. Are we intentional about taking those opportunities to reinforce the right messages and use those as education opportunities rather than um, things that might be you know, counterproductive to values we're trying to instill? I think in some areas we are. Yeah. In some areas we can do a better job. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's, it's, yes, yes and no. You know, I think that there are areas that we can do more. Like the one area that I'm going to recommend to Renee and to all of you is I think that there's potential with coaches. And remember that our coaches are basically volunteers, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times we have open coaching positions and we're so thrilled for all of you coaches out there, thank you. Like, really, they spend a tremendous amount of time with our, with our students. And uh, so, you know, how might I or the system strengthen their understanding um, of how to support students and take on some of these issues that uh, are often a problem or could be a problem for our young people. And, you know, around prom, um, yeah, we, this is, that's something that we've done every, each year is, you know, talk about the, the risks at this time of year. And graduation, too. Um, we, you all support Project Grad, um, which is an important piece of that puzzle and gives us a chance to dialogue about it. Um, it, and there's also the challenge developmentally of, of running into the DARE program. I mean, it, or the impact that the DARE program has had statistically is that it makes it worse. And so last year we did some direct instruction ar around marijuana um, with students and we, had a, we paid a fair amount of money to have somebody come in. We did a parent night, which was not well attended. Um, and students, you know, I, it was mixed results. Like, there was a little bit of, you, you're so lame, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, you don't really know what you're talking about. And so we had a hard time teasing out how effective or how useful that was when we felt like we were addressing and trying to engage our students in a, in a conversation about um, drug use in a, in a whole school manner. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I, I just um, talking to students, there was uh, mixed feedback about whether or not that was useful. Do you think policy guidance from the board would be helpful? What would it be? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. What I'm would it, daunted um, by what it would be. <laughs> what? I'm a little daunted by what it would yeah. be. I'm a little I mean, daunted by what it would be, too. I guess my question is, are... Yeah, given the complexities and given the fact that there is, you know, I, I think I think most of the community is probably more or less in a certain place, but there are, um, there's probably some of the community that isn't. Um, would would you feel more freed up to maybe, um, you know, do things like? Uh, work with coaches on this or work with, you know, general classroom teachers that, you know, these are values and these are roles that, you know, that are important um, and one that, that we wanted to take a part in playing and two that, you know, it, it's okay to have these conversations with kids even though they're, they're tough and they're in seventh grade. Um, you know, you can, you can feel these questions and, um, you know, that type of thing. I'm, I'm not sure either because I think it is complex and daunting. Well, and also, I, I, we don't really have policies that direct curriculum content, no. but there's been a lot of conversation here from the very beginning about what the curriculum looks like. And yeah. so that, when I said I thought it was daunting, that's part part of what I'm thinking about is I feel like we're hearing from the community and we're perhaps experiencing as parents and we're hearing from the educators about, about a curriculum need, which is not something we normally put in policy. And then we're talking about, as Mike said, a range of issues from um, inpatient residential treatment needs all the way to toxic yeah. mas masculinity um, culture in certain areas. I mean, there, there's this enormous 
range of issues that can fall under this umbrella. But I mean, I'm kind of thinking <laughs> of something like Pearson Secondary. To me, there's, there's similar, the most similar thing we have is the DEIJ issues, where we've kind of signaled that this is important and we want our district to embrace these values and take this on really, I think, on a, a cultural and holistic level. Um, but we're not going to say what people should be doing in classrooms, you know, the, you know, what curriculum changes, et cetera, but kind of have set, you know, a value post in the distance that we really find that, you know, the value of, of equity, diversity, and inclusion are important to the district and we want to, you know, support that and, um, you know, kind of signal that, that we care about that. And some of these, you know, when you say rape culture, not everyone is going to say, oh, that's something that that we should accept and, you know, and, and be telling our kids it's out there. Um, I, I don't think so. Um, I, when you first asked, I don't know, maybe, um, but I think given the diversity, equity, inclusion policy that has been passed, I think that as an educator, I would lean on that um, to be able to point to that around things like, well, you know, why, why would you support the conversation? Why would you take class time for that kind of thing? Why would you read, you know, speak in English class? Why would you have, uh, why would you partner with Outright Vermont? Um, all of the, the things that we're working towards having a more inclusive and equitable equitably conscious um, school system and experience for students, I think that you could point to that policy, and I would. And I also think you have a, a drug and alcohol policy, mm -hmm. um, which is there. You know, maybe it's worth revisiting or something, but it's, it's there. And um, you have a nutrition, you know, policy. So do any of those take it directly, no. But I, I sort of agree with Bridget that anything more direct might be curriculum directive. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, the SAP piece, the really taking a look at what we're doing and how we can strengthen and improve that um, are probably the next action steps, in my opinion. Maybe it's a question not of a policy as much as, as a board, we'd expect a report. So we acknowledge it as a problem. We um, want something. We don't know what it is. So, but could we, in so many months, could somebody tell us how we doing? Well, one and of the things we Jim and I were talking about today is having clearly defined goals. Like, yeah. I can't tell you how we're doing on something that's, yeah. that's not defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Health. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <defined. laughs> that's what I, that's what I was raising my hand about. I feel like we're still in the process and it's going to be an evolution probably forever of defining the needs, defining the goals, charting how we want to address them, creating a plan and implementing that plan and updating it and implementing it and updating it. That's yeah, I think that's a really nice point, Andrew, in this, and in the sense, and, and this is putting like my fallacies on the, but there's a lot to, um, particularly the gender piece, that is here now that I don't fully understand because I never experienced it, you know, and, and it wasn't part of my education growing up. And I don't have a community around me like that. That that's a big learning piece for me and I don't I'm not alone in that in the adults in our in our education system. And so some of this is gonna go slower than people want. Some people want because our learning process is there is there and we have to we have to um, allow for that learning to happen, expect it to happen. Not say it can't happen, mm -hmm. but we have to allow for the time to that for that to happen for that learning process. Bridget, um, but I am wondering though if if I mean uh, the the counterpoint to the po the policy why the policy is difficult is that it does prompt reporting, and so as, t as Tina said, having reports back would help the board stay on track about what's happening. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of echoing what several people have said that I feel like, I don't feel very good about just leaving this meeting with no next step 
from the board because I feel like the issue is pressing and that the community concern is really there. Um, yeah. So I'm just look, I'm, I'm struggling with how we could have, whether it's, it's pieces of the issue that we know are the districts moving forward on and we want to make sure that we're hearing about them regularly. Um, and I would definitely want com you know the community, broader community involvement to be a part of any of those um, initiatives if they're going forward. Uh, or if it's having the, the administration come back at a, in a given period of time to have more specific objectives that could then be the basis for reporting. I'm, I'm open to different approaches, but I'm not, I'm not thrilled about the idea of just having the conversation and we, I think that's it the end of it tonight. Yeah, I agree. I think it would be helpful to kind of scope a strategy. Like, what do we want? You know, yeah. I mean, what is what would be helpful too? Um, Sometimes what happens to the board too is you, not you specifically, but somebody comes to say, "Okay, now we need an SAP person," which maybe I've never heard about before, and it seems to come out of the air for the board. You've been working on it for four years, and now you've decided. So that's my theory of of the reporting is not only how you doing, but where are you going, that goal <coughs> of what do you need to get there, I don't have any idea. You know, I'm twice as old as Libby, so I'm in a different <laughs> generation of, of how that goes. So um, I agree. I hate to leave with nothing. I'm not sure what the something is. What if we, yeah. <coughs> so if this is not, you know, we go through years of doing language immersion discussion because it's curriculum based it's developed by the professionals who know how to develop the curriculum around it we support it though and we're visible about supporting it this is a different kind of need and you know if we don't do this right kids commit suicide so i feel a different sense of urgency about the board supporting something to be put together to address these kids in crisis because they are in crisis and i don't know what the solution to it is but just in the much the same way that the racial equality question came up several years ago. We took distinct action in, res in response to it, and the kids took distinct action with it. I don't have the solution to the problem, but I really think the board needs to be involved in finding a specific solution to the problem. And I don't, I have to admit I'm ignorant on what form that that would take, but to me it almost doesn't matter <laughs> if, um, the teachers are not prepared to address this. Um, I think the consequences of not addressing it can be tragic. And um, this is one of those things that we could discuss for years, and I don't think that's going to solve the problem. And I think having a part-time professional on staff that can actually focus, maybe take one or two parts of it, say focus on substance abuse and mental health. Start with that. Um, and then learn as you go with that. I would like to really see us put that into place. I know it's mid-budget year and we did not approve it in the budget for starting the next school year, but I don't think it's too late to do something like that for the next school year. And I'd really like to see us actually request that and move forward to it. I don't know at what place the board actually makes that happen, we can't. But I'd like for us to come out and be public that we recognize the problem and we are committed to doing something about it and we support maybe your proposal to add that part-time FTE next fall. Yeah, I'd make it full-time. Full Even full-time? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's not just the high school. Right, right, between the two, between middle school and high school, I, I, I really, in my own, personal experience with two kids that just graduated from high school, I, I, I sense a real urgency with it. Well, maybe it's a discussion that Libby has with the administration and comes with some thought about yeah. how we proceed since we all just said we don't know how to proceed. Or a plan. <laughs> what they really need the most. And yeah, what, yeah, what do they I mean, need? And, and maybe they don't know that yet. We've talked a lot about developing systems and maybe... Right. Like Mike just gave us his list from the high school, but Pam and the two elementary school principals might have something slightly different and just have them sit down and hash out. These are the couple things that we could do almost immediately to see some positive change. 
But I do think it's important for us to define the needs. I think in some way, <coughs> just putting the cart in front of the horse. Like it seems like that we're in a process of defining of defining the needs, and I think that we we should do that as as a community. As right, a and know where you want to go with those yeah. goals. Well, well yeah, the scope of the obviously. The scope of what we're talking about too. Is yeah. Yeah. A little right. Clear to me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So. And I do think your equity policy has aspects of it. There's an expectation for curriculum and the conflict resolution will educate all students and staff about the significance of how what they say and do affects other students. I mean, there is language in here that can that can support the work already yeah. from a policy lens. Um, it's just how much and when and what do you stop? And maybe you just, it's so broad, maybe you just have to pick one thing right now, even though they all seem to be equally important. We have to start somewhere. Well, I, I would say that we've started lots of places. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're not at ground zero at, at all. On any I didn't mean to imply yeah. that, I'm right. sorry. I, I, yeah, I'm just reiterating that. Um, it doesn't mean that we aren't without <coughs> problems. Um, but, you know, if we're talking about um, LGBTQ plus uh, support, um, you know, could we do more? Yes. Do have do we do a lot? Yes. Um, okay. We're talking Mike, about. Mike, sorry. Yeah. Can you clarify? Are you talking about the high school or the whole district when you're talking? About I this? mean, I the whole district. The whole district, but I mean, of course, I'm colored by the, <laughs> the high school. Yeah. We are, and that yeah. you could use that alone. So you have um, Max Jennings at the elementary school has mm -hmm. a group for gender nonconforming students or mm -hmm. students who are questioning that. They have, she has an after school group. Um, to, to just for a place that's fun and accepting and safe. Um, at, the, uh, at the middle school, we have GSA just like we have here at the high school. Um, I, think, I think there are active steps. All our staff has worked with Outright Vermont around these issues. We have trainers in-house in to work with our colleagues. So there, we have taken active steps in those places. They just may have not ever come to this level to <laughs> report on and exactly what steps we've taken. And it has gone across three buildings anyway. It has not been in focus in Roxbury as of yet because they're new to, they're new still. <laughs> it just hasn't gotten there yet. Yeah, I mean, it seems like there's a, an education component for the board and yeah. a communication, I think, an application component too. Because um, it does sound like we're doing a lot. I'm not sure that story is getting out there. I think, I think what we're hearing a lot is is the horror stories. I mean, and let's be honest, this is, this is a tough thing to get. I mean, you know, coming of age is, you know, the focus of a lot of books for a reason. It's a, it's a difficult <laughs> time. And, um, yeah, it's a difficult time. It's an awkward time there. You know, and I think we're hearing the stories of, of where people feel it's not working. Yeah. Um, and I think to expect it to work all the time is probably unrealistic. But I'm not sure that the board the board has a full understanding of all the things that are being done. Um, to Becky's point, I mean, should a 1.0 FTE for an SAP be put in place, that takes some pressure off of our social workers, and it takes some pressure certainly off of our administrators. Um, it's, an, it's a collaborative effort with Matt Nisley. Or, you know, so, so I could see how that, that piece alone could um, not get rid of problems, but certainly help support our students in a, in a way and support our overtaxed social workers and administrators right. in a way that we currently yeah. can't support them. What, if, what about if we um, created, so if we're th it sounds like the board would like something tangible to come out of this. What if we requested an asset map which would chart out our uh, strengths and resources um, with regard to addressing these health issues based on the four buckets Mike brought up before. I don't know if that seems out of the box or not, but that would show us, you know, that would show us, you know, here, here are the professionals, here are the external groups, here are the different courses that we're offering, that type of thing. Um, it would also inform the community. Right? Yeah, it would inform the community and it would inform, inform us. Um, the four buckets being the four topics in health class? Yeah. Is that what you yeah. I just saw Mike's face. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. paper, like, where are the four yeah. buckets? Yeah. Those are the buckets, but something like that. Something. It doesn't have to be those buckets, but some. We can I'm certainly sure. do that. We can yeah. certainly do that. 
and then then that you could show us, you know, where where do we need where where is the need in light of this? You know, here's here are all of our strengths, here are all of our resources, uh, but you know, here's where we really need some extra help, and here's how this SAP would fit in. Um, it's also going to be a natural big chunk of the information from the youth risk behavior yep. survey. That's when does that come out? Probably this summer. June. Yeah. June. yeah. And so they, they oftentimes districts will put together a little committee um, that includes students and says, okay, here's our data. Wow, we're really high in this, really high in this. Um, what are we going to do about it? And you know, there might be a, a natural opportunity to utilize that um, yeah. for student leadership to involve faculty and maybe a board if somebody wants to join on, in on that. And it uh, seems likely that it could lead to this suggestion that I, I see a lot of nodding heads for around FTE. Um, and then the other thing to me seems like if you're looking for an action step is, you know, I'm, I don't want to volunteer for anything. But, you know, <laughs> but since you're sitting there. Out, but, yeah. Um, yeah he, he has a, a, a team that he's putting together to, to look at this more direct um, health curriculum question. Uh, you know, maybe there's a little paragraph that ends up in the superintendent's report about what's happening so you can get an update about that in the short run. I was just thinking. What's the uh, plan for community and parent involvement as you move forward with the process? I mean, I, I, heard, I heard a reference to aligning the health curriculum K-12, and, and I know that you said you're working with the educators as the starting point. How, yeah. how does that unfold, and how do you wrap parents in the community and yeah. students into that? It's a great question. I was starting with who's teaching health. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, part of the challenge, frankly, is just the time of year. Mm -hmm. and, and sorting that out. We don't have a lot of time to pull a large amount of people out of the classrooms. That was a big consideration. Yeah. Um, so r right now, I, I think there's a couple different directions we could go. Um, there is a high quality inventory around uh, health education. I say that loosely because it involves other things. It involves like nutrition and, and things like that um, that the CDC uh, put out to schools um, th through a I forget the acronym, but it was CCC, something, something like that. In any case, it could be a guiding force for that group, and that, that could involve representatives from the community as well. And then we could think about what that looks like. Um, I think the timeline is a little tricky right now. It's May. Mm -hmm. and, um, so in terms of that work, seeing how we can get organized between now and the end of the year and what that timeline would look like, I think is the next question that, that I, I would volunteer Mike to talk about. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> So the short answer is yes, the community members should absolutely be a part of that. Figuring out who that group is and what the work is, I think, is the, the question that I hear from this group. And how, how do you choose? Like I said, we've had, I've had zero conversations about how to teach my kid how to read, but I've had five conversations with different parents about what should and should not be in front of my kid in health class. So whose voices, I would caution us in thinking whose voices are heard in that. Oh, I think it's tricky. I think it's tricky. And we don't involve parents when we're talking about math curriculum, necessarily. That's right. What, for right or for wrong, we don't mm -hmm. do it. I mean, I'm not putting a judgment right. statement on that, but they're not part of the math committee that we're working on right now. So it's a tri that's a tricky one. I do think the idea of hearing, and maybe from your committee we'll hear about it. I was thinking of Andy saying she came from somewhere else, and, and she knows a lot about it. And yet, she went to the elementary school to try to find out, to the middle school to try to find out, OK, what about a parent that doesn't have her background knowledge? Who in the school system would you go to to ask? Who would you, if your child needed help, say they go to? Are we clear about that? Or do we have anybody to go to? You know, all those things are tricky. Yeah. Tricky. <laughs> But to your point, I mean, you know, obviously one thing that differentiates this is just how pervasive it is with the rest of our lives. I mean, you know, one is not going to have or not have a healthy relationship depending on, you know, what's talking about in this class. So, yeah. yeah. And we're in a political spectrum that this yeah. is, this is yeah, interfaces absolutely. a lot. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't, whichever bucket you're talking about, yeah. it's interfaces a lot. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of news. Well, and it just, it just, the tentacles stretch to, 
I mean, they're complicated tentacles, and they, you know, they intertwine everything. You know, to, to Becky's point, I mean, this, you know, um, you know, these are issues that cause people to take, you know, drastic and, and you know, very tragic actions. So it's it's a uh, it's complicated and it's high stakes. So I mean, I'm I'm kind of thinking that. Um, just kind of continuing this conversation with the administration, so we're educated and, and checking in. I think um, Andrew's suggestion yeah, is a Andrew's great suggestion, one. Yeah, figuring out more of what we have and mm -hmm. um, learning more and uh, you know just assessing as we go along. Because I, uh, yeah, I, I think there's for a variety of reasons a, a policy probably doesn't make sense, and I, I think we want to definitely stay out of areas that we that we shouldn't be in, um, and I think we do have some, some great guidance and policy that you know, signal our, our values, uh, but I also think saying that we had a conversation about it and we're done is, is not going to work either for the board or the community, so I think we need to, need to keep checking in and, and learning more and, and you know, continuing the conversation. And you know, being part of it too, I, that, you know, I'd love to learn more about, you know, to continue to learn more about the resources out there because it sounds like we do have some great Great community partners and great opportunities um, to you know make this a well to take what's already a broad community conversation and, and make it broader. Yeah. Other thoughts? Thank you both. Yeah, thank, thank you, you both. Guys. Yeah, hugely yeah. appreciate it. Um, gonna leave and you're probably gonna keep going and I don't know if I'll see you so I just want to wish you well and to say thanks for being a part of the planning for the gym uh, renovations and things so I really appreciate that. So thanks. And you if I don't see you I wish you well. Yeah. See you later. Bye. <coughs> so I think we're at motion to adjourn. I also want to Thank Lisa for all her fantastic work. Um, it's been a pleasure serving with you. And is this going to be your this is your last, last meeting? meeting? Yes. No. Can't, didn't We're get your No, I would have brought a cake. Uh, I don't know. Are you usually a cake? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're sorry you're leaving. Um, I'll let you adjourn your last meeting if you want to. Oh, I move that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thanks, everyone.